Curtis and Gilliam discover a secret red letter from their unknown informant, telling them to free Namgung Min Su, who's the expert engineer that designed the train's security system and is currently put into deep sleep. Curtis explains to Gilliam that with Nam's insistence, they might be able to successfully stage their revolution. He emphasizes that all previous revolutions failed because they didn't manage to overtake the engine. This time, they plan to seize control of the engine, which would allow Gilliam to assume leadership of the train. During the night, when the guards enter the tail section, they demand that all parents surrender their children for supposed medical examination. A woman in yellow named Claude begins to measure the bodies of the children. Claude then notices Tanya and realizes that she's hiding her son, Timmy, inside her clothes. The guards forcefully take Timmy from Tanya, leaving her beaten on the ground, which one of the passengers throws a shoe at Claude. She remains unfazed, nonchalantly licking the blood off her thumb. The man who threw the shoe is then subjected to a harsh punishment. His arm is thrust through a hole in the train wall, exposing it to the freezing cold outside for seven minutes. During this time, Minister Mason delivers a speech, admonishing the man's actions and reminding the passengers in the tail section of their place in an established order. She warns them against aspiring to the status of their counterparts in the front section. Once the seven minutes elapse, the man's arm, now completely frozen, is brought back inside the train. The guards proceed to shatter his frozen limb with a hammer, causing him excruciating pain. Curtis, while observing the guards, suspects that the guns are devoid of bullets. He believes they might have exhausted their ammunition during the last attempted revolution four years ago. One day, the tail passengers, fed up with the substandard protein blocks, demand real food. Spurred on by his best friend, Edgar, Curtis confronts the guards, daringly placing their guns against his forehead. When the guards pull the trigger, it's revealed that the guns are indeed empty. This revelation triggers the tail passengers to initiate their plan to storm the front in an attempt to seize control of the train. During the ensuing brutal skirmishes, the passengers manage to outnumber the guards. They gain control of several cars by using a large metal tube to prevent the doors from closing. In their quest, they locate Nam's drawer and awaken him. They communicate with him using a translation device as he speaks Korean. Knowing that Nam is addicted to Chrono, Curtis strikes a deal with him, offering a lump of the drug for every door he opens for them. However, Nam, who awakens his daughter Yona from her deep sleep, negotiates for two lumps of Chrono per door as she's an addict as well. Upon opening the next room, the passengers are confronted by windows that display the harsh reality that the world is still frozen, a sight they haven't seen in a long time. Their journey leads them to the car, where the protein blocks are prepared. Here, they find Paul, a former tail passenger who was taken away and assigned the task of making the protein blocks. The revelation that the protein blocks are made of crushed roaches leaves Curtis in shock. He also discovers that Paul has been placing the red letters in the protein blocks. When questioned, Paul reveals that he doesn't write the letters. They're given to him from his supervisors, who instruct him to place them in the blocks. The latest letter they find has water written on it. Despite still not knowing the identity of the sender, Gilliam realizes that the letter conveys the strategic importance of the water section of the train. During a conversation with Yona, Curtis learns that she was born on the train, which led to her developing an exceptionally strong sense of hearing, giving her almost clairvoyant abilities, which allows her to hear what's happening behind walls. As they approach the next door, Yona screams, warning them not to open it, but it's too late. Behind the door, they find a group of masked passengers in armor, wielding axes, seemingly anticipating the rebels' arrival. A bloody battle ensues, resulting in many casualties among the rebels. Suddenly, the battle is interrupted by an officer announcing that they're passing the Yekaterina Bridge, marking the start of a new year. The passengers are suddenly jolted by the sight of massive ice formations colliding with the train, causing it to shake violently. Amidst the chaos, Nam and Yona appear to be the only ones enjoying the moment, as they're high on Cronel. Following this tumultuous event, Mason makes her entrance into the car, declaring that 74% of the rebels will be executed as consequences of their actions. As she finishes her announcement, she and her masked companions don night vision goggles, anticipating the impending darkness as the train enters a tunnel. This leaves the rebellious tail passengers at a disadvantage as they are attacked in the pitch black. In response, the rebels ignite their torches and start retaliating. Noticing Mason injured on the ground, Curtis sees an opportunity to capture her. However, he is faced with a dilemma when he realizes that Edgar has been taken hostage. Understanding the importance of their rebellion, Curtis makes a difficult decision to capture Mason, which tragically results in Edgar's death. With Mason at his mercy, Curtis commands all the guards to drop their weapons, effectively turning the tables in favor of the rebels. Horrified, Mason starts explaining that she merely follows orders and suggests that they should direct their grievances toward Wilford. She offers to lead them to him, pleading for her life and to be spared in exchange for his. Recognizing the heavy losses they've suffered and the condition of the remaining passengers, Gilliam and Curtis devise a plan. Curtis should handcuff Mason and use her as a guide to safely navigate his way to Wilford. The following day, with Mason in handcuffs, Curtis and a handful of other rebels embark on their journey toward the front of the train. They traverse through lush gardens, vibrant aquariums, and a sushi bar. When Mason attempts to indulge in some sushi, Curtis intervenes, forcing her to consume a protein block instead. In the children's school car, the rebels are taken aback by the cult-like reverence 
for Wilford. The teacher enthusiastically indoctrinates the children with songs, films, and tales glorifying Wilford and his magnificent train. While this is going on, a man enters the room with a cart full of boiled eggs, a New Year's tradition. As Curtis receives his egg, he discovers a red letter inside it with blood written on it. Before he can fully grasp the meaning of this, chaos erupts. The seemingly harmless man with the cart and the teacher reveal hidden machine guns loaded with bullets, opening fire on Curtis and his fellow rebels. Several of them fall in the unexpected attack as the children are quickly ushered out of the car. Despite the sudden onslaught, the rebels manage to eliminate the murderous teacher and regain control over Mason. However, a shocking revelation awaits them on the TV screen. Wilford's guards have breached the car housing the rest of the rebels, and they watch as Franco, who's Mason's henchman, kills Gilliam. Overwhelmed by this, Curtis ends Mason's life, silencing her pleas of innocence. As the surviving rebels press on, they witness the oblivious lives of the elite passengers, seemingly unaffected by the turmoil. Their journey is further marred by tragedy when they encounter Franco at the spa. Despite being outnumbered, Franco's physical strength and superior combat skills prove deadly for several rebels. It is only when Nam intervenes that they manage to subdue him. As Tanya takes her last breath, she calls out desperately for her son, Timmy. Moved by her plight, Curtis vows to find him. At the door to Wilford's car, Curtis angrily demands that Nam open it, leading to a tense standoff between the two. When questioned about his anger, Curtis confesses to committing horrific acts when he first boarded the tail of the train. He reveals that at the beginning of the tail, passengers weren't served any food, and after a month of starvation, they resorted to cannibalism. He admits to killing Edgar's mother and nearly killing baby Edgar, only to be stopped by Gilliam, who cut off his own arm and offered it to Curtis to prevent him from killing the baby. Curtis is tormented by his past actions and the fact that he was never able to sacrifice his own limbs for food, unlike many of the tail passengers. His hatred for Wilford stems from their belief that Wilford pushed him and the others to their absolute limits. Understanding Curtis's anguish, Nam is willing to help, only for Claw to abruptly come out of Wilford's car. She instantly shoots Nam and informs Curtis that Wilford has invited him to dinner. Inside his car, Wilford grills steak for Curtis as he reveals a devastating truth. Wilford reveals that he and Gilliam were in fact partners and good friends, and that the revolution in the tail section was orchestrated by the two of them to reduce the train's population, which was becoming too crowded. However, Gilliam overstepped the boundaries, as he was supposed to end the rebellion at the middle of the train, and then head back to the tail after many passengers were killed, thereby creating more space for him and the remaining tail passengers. This deviation from the plan led Wilford to decide to kill Gilliam. Wilford also makes it clear that he's been the one sending Curtis the red letters all along. Meanwhile, in the spa, Franco miraculously wakes up, having somehow survived his previous encounter. This leads to Yona and the wounded Nam finding themselves under attack by a group of front passengers and Franco. Wilford then shows the heart of the engine to Curtis. As chaos ensues among the passengers in the background, Wilford, feeling the weight of his years, offers Curtis his position as the leader of the train. He paints a grim picture of humanity's inherent nature, arguing that they need a strong leader like Curtis to prevent them from devouring each other. As Yona enters the room, she requests matches from Curtis to aid her and her father in their plan to blow open the train's door and escape. Initially, Curtis refuses her request, apparently having fallen under the influence of Wilford. Undeterred, Yona, using her heightened sense of hearing, uncovers a hidden tile on the floor. Beneath it lies a horrifying truth. The children that Wilford takes are used in a torturous form of child labor to keep the train's engine running. This revelation serves as a breaking point for Curtis. Overwhelmed by the horrific discovery, he strikes Wilford, hands Yona the matches, and attempts to rescue the trapped child, who he recognizes as Timmy. In a vivid display of self-sacrifice, Curtis finally manages to give up his arm in an attempt to halt the gears and extract Timmy. As the front section of the train explodes, Yona cradles the young child, finding solace in her father and Curtis's embrace. The explosion triggers an avalanche, causing catastrophic damage to the entire train. In the aftermath, Yona and Timmy awaken. Wearing fur coats, they step outside to witness a polar bear in the distance. This sight confirms her father's hypothesis that the world has become habitable once again.